Oh, okay, very good. So I'm online. Greetings. My name is Vijay Punusami, and as chair of this session on understanding each other globally post COVID, I'm pleased to welcome you and our distinguished panelist, Anthony Chan. Uh, Salon Song and Jacques Turel are also scheduled to join us uh, shortly, but we will certainly not delay our session and start our conversation with Anthony. Anthony Chan is chairman of Gretchen in Hong Kong. He was the chairman of the International Chamber of Commerce of Hong Kong for three consecutive terms between 2008 and 2011. After his retirement, despite his young age, as a lawyer in 2013, Anthony has actively pursued investment projects with sharing economy and humanitarian elements. Welcome, Anthony. And what I'd like to do is basically interact with you on, on a few um, aspects of our uh, theme and then ask the uh, participants to also uh, join in with some questions and, and comments. Let me start with the title of our session, Anthony, uh, which is Understanding Each Other Globally Post-COVID. The first question I'd like to put to you uh, is really about the title, which to me begs the question whether we understood each other globally pre-COVID, and indeed, whether we understand each other globally during COVID. Your thoughts, DeAnthony? Well, you know, I think the, uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, good, 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 okay. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, it, it is, um, it's again a pleasure to be here. Um, I will just keep on talking. I wait, await the other two speakers to come in. I think at some stage, and if any of the audience have questions or want to use their mic to raise a question, please do so because we don't have that many people uh, currently um, uh, on the call. So uh, to respond to your question, uh, Vijay, I think the, the you know it, uh, COVID is a uh, a, a disease or whatever you call it okay it's a, it's a sickness that has affected the world and you use ter we use terms as pandemic or whatever it is okay it's affected every part every corner of the world that for sure okay the problem with a pandemic now we see is of course it's the political overtones i think every day you read the news especially whether it was the start of COVID or even if you like, the, the mere start of COVID had a load of political overtones uh, in the midst of COVID, while wow, it's just everywhere, you know. Uh, and these political overtones, when they are handled in the wrong way, have given rise to, if you like, a lot of unrest in various countries, like it or not. Okay, and that unrest is not going to be forgotten just like that by the masses. I think that's just natural for human beings that we are. So I think in short, the post-COVID situation is going to be, if you like, just as political, maybe with a different twist because everyone needs to come back to some sort of normality. So, but it will be heightened tones of, if you like, political awareness, okay, plus the mass awareness of the health situation around the world and the mass awareness or the people's awareness of certain topics, like it or not, that has been examined to the bone, as it were, uh, during COVID times, okay? So I think, you know, we, we are already seeing this, you know, and and what's better to see it between the two powers of the world that play a, such a big role in everything we do? And we, do, we know who those are, of course, the states and China. Like it or not, even though 
um, COVID is a pandemic as such. The show, okay, <laughs> is about the U.S. and China primarily, okay. Then it would go down to the EU and then other countries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the stars of the show, whether we can call them the stars of the show, you know, certainly the main actors in the show are, you know, engaging because it's an engagement. I think between uh, China and the U.S. Okay, and it's not about right or wrong anymore. You know, these days you read the news, you think, and I, I mean, I'm a, if you like, I'm a, I'm an. I may be slightly old-fashioned. I may not believe everything I see, but you know, you read the news these days. You think, well, they are just <laughs> something that you need to really examine. You have to take the box, fact-check everything before you believe. Okay, so th th there are all these factors, you know, on top of the political situation. Okay, now, now, having said that, the the other side of the coin. Is that because countries realize that they have to improve themselves? There's no way we can survive just like that. So, so any country, whether it's U.S. or China or even any other country in the world, will have to find a way to start going back to normality. That no normality isn't going to happen unless the political forces are at play to make it happen. Now, Vijay, you're from Singapore. I'm sitting here in Hong Kong. Just between Hong Kong and Singapore, which is going to be, if you like, a simple solution. I think when to get people back to normality, get people to travel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, we've been discussing. I don't know how many times about this so-called bubble to allow travelers to fly between this or envisage upon some sort of no COVID cases for a number of days, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The rules surrounding bilateral. Uh, relationships are adjustable between the countries. Okay, subject to reasonable, if you like, uh, health-related uh, uh, precautions. Okay, but at least bilaterally between countries and between jurisdictions, they are adjustable at the behest of the two countries, um, and that is already fairly difficult. You know, I mean, you know, uh, and then then you have cases and and Tokyo. Olympics is probably a very good example. Is you have bigger conglomerations where the whole world is involved, and we have an event happening this year. In fact, you know a long event because it's both the Olympics and Paralympics that need to be catered for. Okay, and all that you know is going to be a really difficult situation for everyone to 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 manage. Okay, now. I, to be honest, even with bilateral relationships where you're talking about the ability to travel and the conditions of travel, which is mainly conditions of transit, essentially, and the ability to give flight services that, that are able to um, support these conditions is already a big, um, if you like, situation in itself. Okay. Now, if you then go to a situation where It's a block between a block of countries and another block. Okay, It's slightly more than bilateral. Let's say EU block and ASEAN. Let's say I don't know. I mean, just give an example. Okay, as a next type of situation, EU block and ASEAN. So, so how difficult it is to negotiate a a a manner in which people can travel and continue trade. You know, not that easy. It gets more and more difficult. Okay. And it, there is always the political overtones that make it even, even, even more ultra difficult. Um, so, so anyway, going back to the major players, I think China and U.S. definitely have a guiding role to play. Okay, now I really wish they would sit down and actually negotiate something out because, to be absolutely honest, casting differences aside. It should not be such a big issue, you know. Really, it should not be an issue. It's not. It is not. It is not. Um, you know, everyone ha wants to achieve the same goal. The goals should be relatively the same. You know, if you cast aside the political aspirations of both countries, the goals actually should be roughly the same. Okay. Now, I don't know. I mean, I have other people joining now. I think Frank is here actually. 
Thank you, Frank. Hi, how are you? Um, so, so, um, so anyway, you know, I think, I think, I, uh, you know, I, I, I would, you know, push, uh, put the baton back to you a bit, Vijay. You, are, you and I, I seem to be the only ones currently on the panel. Yeah, but would so you agree? Like see, if you talk about understanding and mm. mm. understanding, which we are talking about now, mm. as uh, whether it exists today or whether it will exist post COVID. Mm. Uh, understanding requires full transparency, trustworthiness, mm. accountability, as well as people and institutions of integrity to ensure that the common good prevails and be seen to prevail mm. over vested interests. Mm. Yes, I mean, that is somewhat, I mean, I think it's theoretically correct. I think it's theoretical. I don't think, um, if you look at how international rules are written, I don't think international rules are written on transparency. At least that's not what I think. Maybe, you know, my knowledge of international relations are, are somewhat limited because that's not how, you know, you know, it's not my area. So I, I, unlike yours, I think I would like to hear your views instead. But as far as I know, I do not think international rules are written in transparency. Internationals are negotiated so that they are acceptable to the, 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 the major economies of the world. And then, if you like, pushed upon the lesser economies of the world. You know, I think most international rules may start off having this thing about transparency and more cooperation and all that. But, but I think in practice, it deviates from that because it, every country will, it, it's natural. I think it's not, it's not, I'm not asking, you know, it'd be difficult for certain countries to be entirely transparent on a certain topic, but they could be entirely transparent on another topic. Whereas some other country will say, oh, no, this topic is highly <laughs> sensitive, but we can be transparent on another topic. So even that alone has got its own deviations. Um, anyway, that, that's just my, my thinking. I mean, yeah. it's a very but personal it, it, it view. It does raise a very interesting yeah. question because you obviously yeah. you're very pessimistic about mm. the uh, Committee of Nations coming together to drive the common good. Because at the end of the day, uh, if you look at international institutions, let's say the mm. UN system, uh, mm. it obviously is, is a... Is a one country, one vote. You obviously have a veto system at the Security Council. Mm. But if things have to change, in fact, I'd like to quote you uh, mm. Mm. from the, the recent report, mm. uh, which was entitled COVID-19, mm. Make It the Last Pandemic, by the Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response, which was released on 12 May mm. uh, this year. Mm. And it concluded, and I quote, because this, I think, is something we should reflect on. It says, and this is a, 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 a panel which worked for almost a year uh, to actually try to uh, help the world mm. better understand what mm. went wrong uh, mm. with the way COVID-19 was managed ever since it first appeared. Mm. Uh, and how can we learn from those uh, mistakes and, and missteps to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Mm. So, but it, it's, and I'll quote you because it actually says, it's an 86 page report, but this paragraph stands out uh, for a reason which probably become obvious after you've heard it. It mm. said, current institutions, public and private, mm. fail to protect people from a devastating pandemic. Mm. Without change, Mm. They will not prevent a future one, mm. which suggests that, as you rightly point out yourself in your remarks, that with this lack of transparency and probably lack of trust, lack mm. of, of understanding mm. between those who have been empowered to organize and govern our world. I'm not talking about national institutions, I'm not talking about more the international institutions, that these institutions actually failed us. And if changes are not brought about, they will mm. fail us again. 
I mean, that's probably for me in the, in that eighty six report page report, the most worrying part mm. that this can happen again because the system which allowed this to happen in the first place has not been changed. And that's I, what I think, I think is, yeah. what changes you think should, uh, even if it's an ideal world, mm. should we be talking about to ensure that mm. going forward mm. we do not have another COVID mm. thrust upon the world mm. in the way this one was. Mm. Well, I think I think to be to be honest, I I think I don't know what the next pandemic is, but I think with the population growing, with lots of pressures on the environment, etc., having another pandemic is certainly foreseeable. Okay, the question is how long can we manage before we see the next one? Okay, and what lessons have we learned? Now, this is where the international multilateral agencies or people like who would. Would would play a big role, you know. I mean, but of course, who can only play a big role if they're supported by the members? Okay, so so I I you know again for even for individual countries, no matter whether it's USA or China, even if they have a way to do things, I don't think they can do it on their own. Okay, now.、Um, As I say, the lead has to come from the bigger nations, okay. And the fact is,、um, what the pandemic has shown is that just because your economy is much more developed and advanced, and what is purportedly your medical healthcare system is that more advanced than other countries, this pandemic has shown that it doesn't really equate to preparedness for a pandemic. So there are plenty of lessons that、um, is being learned all the time. Okay, how governments react is one thing. Okay, internally because governments when they react they have to take care of many things. You know, it's not just the relationship, not in, not merely. In fact, international relationships may not even rank very high in the agenda. It it will presumably be making sure that people are safe. Their people are politically on their side. You know there won't be any rebellion as a result, etc., etc. So there will be other things. You know, as they as they say in、um, as they say in certain countries, when a president of a country makes an announcement, that announcement is not made to the world; it's made to its people to pacify its people. You know, and this is the continuing trend now.、Uh, Okay, that, those are what we call public、uh, matters that everyone gets to see, and then there are non-public matters that no one gets to see but are action upon. Now, these we may not know until they are disclosed. Okay, now I'm pretty sure that both, not not both. I mean, all nations in the world that have had experience with the pandemic have learned some lessons from it. And they know there's a checklist, and everyone I think would have a checklist of what they have to do. Okay, the question is, who should actually mastermind a global checklist? Okay, who should be able to, if you like, babysit some nations in ensuring the checklist is catered for and done in a particular fashion or satisfied in a particular fashion, and then also at the same time. You know, add a few more ideas on them to help nations along. Now, all this is, of course, you will say, is the、uh, you know the global community and all that. But to be honest, it's not that easy for the global community to achieve things. You know, I mean, the pandemic has showed it's not that easy. Okay, and unfortunately, human nature is such that politics always gets in the way. You know, at the end, at the end, if you like. The way to justify, not not to justify, the way to describe the pandemic is basically to say, if it had not been human mistakes, okay, the pandemic would not be as bad as it is, you know. And these human mistakes rest squarely, I think, in leadership of countries, not necessarily with people on the ground, okay, because it's a question of how you deal with it once. You know it's going to be a pandemic. Now, of course, 
human nature is such that you tend to say, oh, nothing, we, we have this under control, we have this under control. That's human nature. But nonetheless, despite that, you know, what we are seeing is that, and the people feel it, the masses feel it, is that the governments have not done enough. Okay, now that is the important takeaway, I think, for a lot of governments. How every government handle it to be quite different. Okay, but I, you know, I, I can't, you know, I mean, I'm just a little person, I cannot really change the world, as it were. Uh, but, but I, you know, I actually like to hear more of your views because I think many of these things you have a much more insight, whereas I'm just speaking from the gut, you know, if you like. Yeah. No, that that yeah. that that's mm. Uh, mm. the most important uh, uh, and wise comments normally comes from the guts. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, the, the the initial comments come from the gut, but then you know the gut is the gut. You know, the heart is the heart. But, no? but I think your your yeah. point yeah. you make here at the end yeah. of the day, which yeah. is uh, true, and I think that also came out in that um, mm. report from the. Uh, uh, COVID panel, that it all comes down to leadership. So leadership, uh, national leadership and international leadership. Uh, I think international leadership is basically as to do with the UN system yeah. and how the UN system uh, basically was part of uh, the problem which needs to be addressed. And, and the, the panel basically identifies ways and means where, for example, institutions like WHO could have yeah. done better, yeah. perhaps with new new rules and new powers, yeah. uh, and where countries could have done better. Uh, and I think your point about leadership is, is, is very clear. Yeah. And I think that's probably one thing which comes out of this pandemic is that uh, people now understand that they are, like you mentioned yourself, you basically depend on people who are empowered to take decisions, to take the right decisions, uh, to protect life, to protect society, and to allow, uh, you know, for a healthy, safe, and, and, and fair society to be developed. So that comes down to real leadership. Uh, and I think if anything the pandemic has shown us is going forward, we will need to pay more attention in terms of the values we seek uh, in leaders and in terms of the uh, deliverables we expect from leaders. Right. You're absolutely right. I think, I think the leadership of countries, certainly it's, it's, they have to learn a lot. You know, um, whether or not they're at fault, they, there's still plenty to learn. That, that's for sure. The other thing is, is that the pandemic has also opened up newer sectors that we've not thought about, uh, which I think can become a sector for growth to help economies grow around the world, okay, as a result. You know, um, I think no one in their right mind has thought of healthcare in such an important light as now. Yeah, you right. know. Where will you get a hit on everyone to say, oh, vaccination, you know, they count the face masks, you know. Mm. Um, so all these things, I think the populace, the masses have taken on and they are here to stay. That's the good thing. So if you say to me, you know, will there be another pandemic? Possibly. But, you know, we've taken precautions and I think people are not going to forget the precautions. And... There will be industry sectors, and I think, I think certainly in the healthcare sector, there'll be plenty of, if you like, emphasis on that. Now, in the same way, there are other sectors which we believe also are growing, and like mental health care, you know, something like that. You know, being confined in a confined space for ages, you know, gives you mental problems, as you know, like. Psych psychology dictates that you know there has to be some way to deal with those problems. So, so, so for me, at least, you know, I think that I look at this as a uh, very um, um, effective way to live a better life. I like to look at this as a really good way to live a better life. But that's, if I can pick up on that, yeah. those very words you just used, yeah. uh, a better life. Yeah. Because I think, again, connected with our 
notion of understanding going forward. Understanding normally is based on a, uh, at least some right. shared values and, right. and a, a shared understanding right. of what our aspirations are. Right. And when you talk about a better life, the question I'd like to raise and actually put it to you is whether yeah. the pandemic has actually changed our notion of a better life in terms of our aspirations what do we what do we re- see as success today as opposed to what we saw as success before the pandemic i'm talking about personal success well you know one of the crazy things about pandemic is unless you have your covid you end up with covid you actually become i think generally much healthier you know i certainly my experience was i hadn't been ill for 18 months i don't think because my exposure to germs been you know i don't know how many times less now because i clean my hands i wash my face i do all the things that people tell me to do you know who would wash their hands for 18 to 20 seconds every day every time if you follow the rules okay it actually works you know, it works. I've been, if you like, a healthier, I mean, at least for not catching your flu, your cold. Yeah. I've not had flu. I've not had cold. I've not had many things for a whole year. Okay, I had stress-related matters, correct? Okay, but if I can, you know, if I can improve my lifestyle a bit, my, might be the, li- the, the stress-related matters would go away, but I would still keep living this lifestyle because I know it's good for me, you know? When I was 20 months ago, I would have a cold every, let's say, two, three months, something like that. I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I mean, everyone has his own things, but, you know, uh, you know, nothing great. But, you know, I have a day, I have a cold. I sometimes have a flu, you know, a flu may be less because I have flu jabs. OK, so so maybe not, not that. But it's all good for us. You know, if you think about it, it actually is a way it is a way where we have to change our lifestyle. Once you change it, you always remember. That's what is good, you know. And we are humans. We learn by our mistakes. Unfortunately, I think that's a time-honored idiom. We do learn by our mistakes. Yeah. I mean, so what, the, what is your view? I mean, yeah. what is your view? No, I agree with you. I, I definitely, uh, I mean, you would say uh, four weeks or eight weeks uh, are habit-forming. Yeah. And it's been now um, almost a year and a, uh, a year and a half of uh, new habits yeah Uh, and and i agree with you that it has forced us uh, to adapt in ways which are in some respects uh, beneficial in terms our lifestyle in terms of our perhaps recognizing uh what we perhaps took for granted too often in the past uh be it our health be it our our relationships be it our communications so it has in a way as we always say, it, it, it's you appreciate things much more, or even people much more, yeah. once you lost them. And if it's a temporary yeah. loss, it's great. You can always kind of make up for for that. But sometimes it, it's a permanent loss. Yeah. But I think yeah. it, it's been a way, uh, and I think yeah. that's probably the positive side, where we should not waste that opportunity which was given to reflect on how we were living and what we were focusing on. Uh, whether what we are focusing on uh, are just as significant in this new world as they were, let's say, in the the pre-COVID world. Yeah. Uh, whether yeah. we should not now, uh, in a way, rejuggle our uh, our priorities in terms of what really what is important, what right. is essential. Right. Uh, but but, but as actually, actually whilst, whilst I interject with you on that. The last Please. few words are very important. What is essential? You were saying, yes, yes. what are essentials? And, and actually, you're absolutely right. The priorities have changed a bit. And this is a very good point you made. Um, um, my priorities certainly changed a bit. You know, in, in the past, I wouldn't care too much about my health, thinking, okay, well, I'm getting old, but I'm okay. I'm still walking. I don't have problems. You've got time to take care of yeah. that. Yeah, but, but, you know, with COVID, you sort of think, hmm. You know, and I have some of my friends, actually, the whole family had COVID in, in Britain. You know, I have some very good yeah. friends. They don't tell people they've had COVID. And then yeah. we had a 
catch up cold. Ah, oh, you know, I'm a whole family had COVID. I said, wow, you know, this is like, oh, you know, you never, never expect it. So all that has changed priorities. So, I mean, I can only speak for myself, but health has certainly gone, you know, to the top of the pile. Okay, for sure. The other thing is, you know, when I was um, very much uh, in the business mode, I would be traveling all the time. Mm-hmm. Okay, will I go back to traveling all the time? And does business need to have to you have to travel for your business? Now, I, I'm in a line of business where, you know, we have to meet people, you know, face to face. And the last eighteen months or so, I haven't met anyone face to face. You would never have imagined it. So, does it work for business, for example? Now, this is still the continuing question for us, and because we are in the investment business, um, we're always wondering, you know, what people feel like. You cannot, you cannot feel the people. Okay, you can see the people, but you cannot feel the people. The feeling is very important. So, so I think, I think this, you know, my life. I think in terms of me going forward. Yes, I will still、uh, want to travel, but I will certainly be traveling much less. Okay, I think I think I've conquered a way where、uh, I think some of the work that I do can be done, if you like, remotely. Okay, and then、um, the rest, you know, we just we just see if there's a bridge, you know, to 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 make it work, and then therefore, you know, for example.、Um, Uh, and and then part of it is purely because I think these quarantine rules, even though there'll be a relaxation, the quarantine rules would not go away way overnight. So traveling is a chore, you know. It's no longer like you can go in and out, okay. So it would take three weeks to do a two day meeting, for example. Now that one I think is going to be difficult from business angle. So that's pure business. So I look forward to seeing you on more of these、uh, run the world schemes. <laughs>、yes. Basically, you know, I don't, you know, to be absolute frank, you know, I think, I think an event like this is great, but I think for the future, I think for many events forthcoming will still be in the same manner. I, I, I think probably. Yeah. Yeah. Dandy,、yeah. if I could follow up on your earlier point about、mm. changing priorities、mm. at a personal level.、Mm. And we try to extrapolate this now.、Mm. See if, if individuals, because of the experience of、uh, the COVID pandemic,、yeah. have, have made some adjustments in terms of their priorities, in terms、yeah. of their life aspirations,、uh, in、yeah. terms of their、uh, lifestyle.、Yeah. Would it then mean that they, the expectations of their leaders? I talk here about maybe national leaders、mm. uh, would also have changed in the sense that what would be the、uh, the KPIs mm. Mm. of of、uh, they would expect of their leaders would that have changed? Because for them, if priority now has changed,、mm. would they also expect their leaders to focus on other things,、uh, which of course. Would mean be more meaningful to them. Of course, it's natural, right? It's natural. Now,、um, and this is where there is this issue about、uh, the different governments in every country. You know, as you know, in the democratic nations, because leaderships are elected every, say, four to five years.、Mm-hmm. You know, we know there is a there's a way of dealing with this. So when you are like in your th- Third year of your fourth year term, you adjust, you know, in in a whatever way, so that you get reelected. All right. So, so, but if you're in the first year of the term, you know, you have a few years to play around, you know. So, so in those democratic societies where, where, and this is where the politics of it comes in, and at the end of the day, the leadership always want to get the votes, you know. So, so, so yes, I mean. Uh, what is clear is that everyone is looking at a better,、uh, if you like, a, a such a much better way、uh, on the healthcare side. I think there is no doubt about it because everyone has suffered. Okay, and and no matter how good, and this is this is really classic for the world to learn. Always hope the best 
healthcare in many countries have not meant much, I think, in the in a pandemic. And everyone is asking, you know, we we pay so much high taxes, we've done this, and you know, it's the greatest healthcare service in the world. So we thought, hey, but there's so many deaths, and what happens? You 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 leave your old age folks at home, you know, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, you know, okay. So you have all these lessons to be learned. Okay, so does that need to improve? Yes, I think health now is like the top of the agenda. I think there's no doubt about that. Mm. Uh, looking after certain categories of uh, of the population, like elderly folks, for example, could have taken a bit more priority now. I don't know. I mean, it depends on the country, of course. You know, uh, Asian countries, as you know, we are probably taking care of old folks by the younger generation anyway, so there's probably less of a significance, okay? Uh, in Western nations, because of the culture and all that, you know, it's a different situation. But I think um, certainly if you look at the Asian, not, not so much Asian, let's say you look at China, of course the leadership have learned a lot, okay? I think they've learned a lot, and, 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 but, you know, they, 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 are they are obviously sharpening their senses to what's needed, okay? Uh, they may not have the election issues that they have to, to please people every few years, but, you know, China has these five-year plans, so it's not like they don't have planning. But I would expect to see in the next five-year plan, you know, a much more um, involvement on the healthcare promotion side. Now, China is our market, my own market, and I would say that one of the biggest things that they have not done and China has actually acknowledged it in, in themselves, okay, is that they have tried in the past and failed in healthcare for the, for the people, okay. They've actually, the government actually has not acknowledged that. And they've always been improving. But as you know, with healthcare, and then this is the China situation, you know, at some stage, it needs to follow some Western model, business model of healthcare. If the state takes over healthcare forever, the state will go bankrupt. It needs some insurance-backed situation, some private element. The more private, actually, the mixture, the better it is, I think, for many countries, China included. And China is getting to that. So if there are businesses, and we also invest in businesses that help China to turn the state model into a private model, they love that because it takes away that ultimate responsibility, especially with that old age population. So for big countries where you have a big old age population, you cannot just afford to do it state statewide, you know. So that that's the thing. So so every country is a bit different, but health is really top of the agenda, is how you do it, how you care for it. And what it has done, what the pandemic has done is that it opens people's eyes as to the levels and the breadth of healthcare that needs to be available. That is the problem for a lot of governments. It's not just dealing with the future pandemic, it's the fact that there are so many things that suddenly people think, oh, my teeth is not right, okay? Oh, my renal thing is not right. Can't you give me a better service? It opens up so many other things, okay? So, so all that means, you know, governments have more to do, okay? Now, for governments who have, uh, I would say, a limited budget, all governments have limited budget, so it's a question of how you shift things in, in, from a high, you know, high spending area to another area so that you have this money uh, to spend on healthcare, for example. How people do it, how governments do it, that is another matter. Okay, but, but certainly I, I would expect that all governments these days would show their people, show their masses that the spending would have gone up. And they have to show some results of that spending. This is what I would perceive. Yeah. Know, but that raises also a question. Uh, yeah. Clearly, there will be more work to be done, more expectations, perhaps mm. different expectations from governments. But still, they will have to uh, step up and deliver, and and that would require uh, resources, uh, a lot of which has been spent 
managing this current <laughs> pandemic. And going forward, uh, clearly, governments will need more resources. Uh, and and the challenge then is when economies are not thriving, yeah. governments need more resources. Yeah. Also, perhaps in this current environment, yeah. uh, a, a, a thorough review of how governments raise funds. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about taxation. Yeah. Uh, what is your view on that uh notion of a, a universal uh, minimum taxation which uh, and and do you think that will help uh, uh, countries which have limited resources find the adequate resources to deal with the challenges at hand um, I, I think primarily um, in terms of additional financial resources, uh, I can't say too much. My view is mainly a swapping of resources, transferring something from somewhere into a into the budget. So you you just yeah, redirecting and redirecting exactly redirecting the same time, but you just yeah. Yeah. rather than going yeah. out to raise money. Of course, it is possible to raise money because most countries. Uh, if they issue a, a, a government bond, it's still possible, you know, at a decent rate, you know, with the support of, you know, the World Health Organization and other multilateral agencies, you know, it is still possible, okay? But putting the burden on the masses where the burden is already extreme is not a great way, especially in countries where, where governments need to be re-elected. I think they, 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 you know, obviously the big issue is they, they do that. Now, of course, you can always argue that maybe they can levy a tax on tourism or something else or travel-related things or something that locals don't get taxed on but foreigners visiting. But then again, that takes away you know, people's uh, as, um, desire to go and travel and, and, and keep the economy going. So, so either way, it's going to be hit. You know? I, I still think that the way is for governments to readjust the budget. You know that that is, I think, the 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 way. And and to be to be honest, if if people think about um, uh, a way to give to render certain healthcare services, it need not be a very expensive way to do it. Okay, ultimately it could be very expensive, but that's in the future. Mm -hmm. But there's slight improvements that you know in terms of knowledge and the ordinary uh, caution for prevention okay you're talking about prevention you're not using drugs to cure okay you're talking about prevention you know when 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 governments action these things is to prevent the next pandemic okay now if governments are still in the midst of fighting covid and to be honest this is the crazy thing i don't know when covid is going to pass okay i know our talk is about post covid Mm. But to be absolutely honest, I don't know. Actually, the pressure is on governments now to fight COVID because the people cannot wait. Governments, to be honest, may not exactly know what to do. And that's exactly. that's a credit to them. I mean, it's not it's not like, you know, it, it's just, you know, it's you can make a mistake. And I, I think the mistake should be forgiven, whatever it is, because it's it's a new thing for everyone. Okay. But... That is where the big pressure is, you know. Excellent. Yeah. But thank you, Anthony. I think we, we are now. Yeah, we are now close. Yeah. Okay. So I want to thank you for uh, for this engaging uh, session. And to conclude, I'll just say that whilst nobody knows how all this will play out and, and how long, as you rightly said, Anthony, mm. this will last, mm. we must all wake up to the fact that the new priorities mm. of the new normal. Yeah. Require new mindsets, yeah. to find new solutions for a safe, secure, healthier, and socially, environmentally, and economically just and sustainable development model, which can be embraced by communities, communities which are increasingly moving from having to accept what cannot be changed to having to change what cannot be accepted. Thank you very much. Please stay safe. All the best. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vijay. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.